Dr. Dana Mail is a registered provisional psychologist with Tom Baker Cancer Center here in Calgary in the Department of Psychosocial Oncology. Uh, her research interests include developing and evaluating psychosocial programs that meet the evolving needs of those affected by cancer and she hopes to make these services more widely available and accessible. Thank you all for having me here tonight. I'm really looking forward to speaking to you all. And it is really nice to have um, most of you here on, or a few of you at least, um, on video. Um, that really helps me as a presenter. It's nice to see your faces and get some feedback. Um, and so, yeah, I was really, um, looking forward to this presentation because I think it is such an important topic right now um, that I think is affecting all of us. And so my hope is that by the end of this presentation um, that you have a better understanding of what mental wellness involves or maybe confirms what you already um, understand about that, but also hopefully a few practical strategies that you might even consider applying in the next few days, weeks, and even beyond. Um, and like any presentation, not everything is likely to fit for you. So I always tell people just, you know, take what fits and, and leave the rest. Okay, so um, not sure how interactive these meetings are, but I thought I might actually start with a question for those of you who feel comfortable, whether using the chat or unmuting yourselves. But I'm curious what your uh, definition of mental health is, given that that seems like a pretty important topic to clarify before we talk about how to improve it and maintain it during this period. But if anyone feels comfortable or brave enough to share, what does mental health mean to you? You're able to go about your daily business, not uh, really worrying about what's happening inside your head. Mm. Okay, thank you, Mike. So you're speaking to kind of the difference between um, what's going on around us versus our internal experience and kind of buffering against maybe those circumstances that are happening. Yeah, I like that definition. Anybody else? Uh, for me, it's really uh, a sense of, not of well-being, but uh, self-awareness. So it's being aware of here, what you're feeling and how you're reacting to the environment around you. Thank you, Brad. Yeah, that's a great um, explanation. I like it because there's two pieces that you highlight. One is um, that well-being, and I would absolutely agree with that. And the other is that we actually have greater control over managing our mental health if we have that insight or that awareness that you're talking about to recognize where our mental health is at at any given moment and be able to um, do some things that might might help. Um, so. Uh, let's see here. You know, often people actually use the term um, mental health interchangeably um, with mental illness, and that is an important distinction. It sounds like one that um, this group is well aware of, that while one in five people in Canada will experience a mental health problem or illness in any given year, five in five of us have mental health. So it's something that we all possess. Um, and I really like the way that this organization, um, Canadian Mental Health Association, defines mental health on their website. And they describe it as just like we each have a state of physical health, um, that we also each have a state of mental health to look after. And it's not just about surviving through life, but thriving to the extent possible. So enjoying life, um, having a sense of purpose, and being able to manage the inevitable highs and lows. And they talk about six common factors um, that have been consistently seen across different cultures, but um, especially across Canada when it comes to good mental health. And so those six things are a sense of purpose, strong relationships, feeling connected to others, having a good sense of self, coping with stress, and enjoying life. And so the pandemic um, actually affects every single one of these factors, right? And so it's also not just an acute short-lived event anymore. We're going on 10 months of um, what's become a persistent challenge to each of these factors of well-being. 
Um, so with that, I think really this slide is about just kind of reviewing that one, it's normal to experience fluctuations in mental health. And two, it is normal and human to feel that our mental health uh, might be affected right now by this pandemic. Okay, thanks, Rhett. We can go to the next one. Thanks. Um, so this is an interesting study that I came across that was recently published in The Oncologist, and it looked at how the pandemic has impacted people living with cancer specifically. So the researchers sampled two and a half million tweets from Twitter and uh, 21,800 posts from international online cancer support groups. And they sampled between the dates of February 1st and April 30th of last year of 2020 when the pandemic started. And so what they found, um, this graph is, it might be a little confusing, but I'll just kind of explain the general findings, um, were that overall there were positive feelings um, that decreased during that time. And most common feelings were fear and joy. So that's the um, red line along that graph and blue. Um, and what they found though is that fear was consistently expressed through um, that time period they looked at, whereas joy seemed to actually gradually decrease, um, but with intermittent spikes that seemed to correspond with media updates about treatments of COVID-19. Um, so whereas they also found that the tweets that they looked at online were um, focused on comments about treatment delays, delays in diagnosis, weakened immunity, and they found that people talking on online support groups focused on cancellation of consultations, missed scans, risks that come along with chemotherapy. And they also found in addition to the medical impacts of the pandemic, um, that people were concerned about mental health and adjusting to quote the new normal and daily physical activity, how that was being impacted. So it's important to keep in mind that this data is of course only capturing the experiences of those who took two online groups and Twitter to express what they were going through at that time. And so it might not be capturing everybody's experience, but it does tell us about some of the unique ways that the pandemic may be affecting people living with cancer um, above and beyond what might be true for um, the average person at this point in time. Okay, so clearly this pandemic is prevent, presenting very real, very ongoing challenges to our physical, economic, social, and emotional well being. And there are things that we can do to buffer against that stress and enhance and preserve our mental health going forward. So I wanted to share this quote, which is um, from someone named Viktor Frankl. Some of you might be aware of him or know about his work. He was an Austrian uh, neurologist and psychiatrist who was also a Holocaust survivor. And he wrote a lot about his experience in different Nazi concentration camps um, and particularly what he learned through his experience about human resilience and our ability to cope through even the most atrocious circumstances. So he wrote, forces beyond your control can take away everything you possess except one thing, your freedom to choose how you will respond to the situation. And I like that because um, I think it, it speaks to, um, you know, if people could make it through some of these really hard times in history, we're certainly facing our own historical challenges right now when we might um, take something from these lessons. Um, and if you're interested to read more about his experience, I really recommend his book, uh, Man's Search for Meaning. Okay, so if our response to what's happening around us is one of the few things that's actually in our control right now, uh, we'd be wise to find some ways to do so. So in order to do that, um, we first need to recognize and acknowledge that we're actually having a reaction to what's going on in our environment. So to Brad's point, right, we have to have that awareness that something's coming up for us. Um, so maybe it's a feeling of loneliness. Maybe some of you might be feeling angry lately or bored. Um, secondly, we want to be curious about what that reaction might be telling us. Our emotions communicate important information to ourselves as well as the people around us about what we might be needing. And it might be common to think that um, just because our feelings are uncomfortable, um, that that might mean that there's something wrong with us. But in fact, it's kind of the opposite, that 
the when we feel distressed, that's our body's way of trying to get our attention and alert us to something not being quite right. Um, and it actually has to feel uncomfortable for us to pay attention to our body amidst all the distractions going on around us. So once we've recognized that we're having a reaction and we start to wonder what that might mean, um, then we can more freely choose, as Viktor Frankl talks about, that freedom to choose our reaction, how we might respond to that situation. So think of this like emotional problem solving. If our feeling of, let's say, loneliness, for example, signals that there's a problem, that's going to drive us to seek out a solution to that problem, such as see, uh, seeking connection. And if we can take that action toward that solution, it's like checking off an emotional to-do. We've kind of addressed that issue and you might even notice those feelings of loneliness dissipate or go away. And that's a good sign that we've kind of gotten what we need. So yeah, we've talked about how mental health is something that we all share and is universal to us as human beings. This is also true of our capacity to experience what we call basic emotions. So each one of us is actually biologically uh, hardwired to experience the same basic emotions, including these four on the screen here. So anger, fear, sadness, joy, um, embarrassment, guilt, surprise, disgust. Those are also um, emotions that have been identified as being universal around the world. Um, but I'm just going to focus on these four today because they seem to be the ones that come up most frequently in my work with people uh, these days when we're talking about coping with the pandemic. So each of these four feelings, <clears throat> excuse me, is are reliably activated in response to certain situations and they lead us to behave in predictable ways that are aimed at getting um, our needs met. And so these reactions tend to happen kind of instinctively, whether or not we are aware of them. Um, and we've actually inherited these responses from our ancestors because they actually helped us adapt in the past. And so the message here is that our emotions are actually more predictable and reliable than we might sometimes understand them to be. And if we can kind of learn more about them and what they're telling us, um, we're better prepared how to cope with those feelings. And so feeling strong, even mixed emotions these days is very um, natural, very understandable, given the global and more immediate context. Um, and the fact that we're all feeling these uncomfortable feelings is in fact our body's way of saying something is not quite right, right? And the landscape is not normal right now. Our emotions are just trying to communicate that to us. Thanks, Rhett, we can go forward here. So the rest of this talk is geared at helping you find ways to regulate each of those different emotional responses and hopefully help you adapt to this landscape. Now, it might be um, helpful for you to even just kind of think as we go through these slides, what ideas might stand out for you specifically? Which ones do you think you might like to put into practice? And we can check in around that at the end of the presentation. Okay. So the first feeling, anger. Anger is a basic emotion that we all experience in response to being blocked from some sort of goal. Um, sometimes when we feel disrespected in some way or have a personal boundary that gets crossed or having something taken from us. If we apply that to the pandemic um, and to cancer, there is a lot to possibly feel angry about, right? If we think about um, why we might feel angry. And so if you take a minute and ask yourself, what goals of yours have been blocked by this pandemic, right? Are there ways that you've been feeling um, mistreated or feeling that you've had your personal space or boundaries kind of encroached on in some way, shape or form? So whether it's due to COVID and the restrictions that come with that, or maybe uh, restrictions that come with being in treatment. Um, many of you might be feeling varying degrees of anger and that's healthy and it's normal. And um, in fact, anger is a feeling that motivates us to seek out respect, power and freedom. So it's just about trying to learn healthy ways of getting those needs met. So when we're under stress and our mental resources are not at full capacity and um, we don't have a moment to step back and observe what's happening, these are some of the ways that anger can come out and be expressed. So it might look like um, being very irritable with the people around us. We might snap 
or even yell sometimes. We might become demanding of people around us, or we might withdraw and, uh, or push people away from us. If we can recognize that those behaviors are actually signaling to us that we might be feeling angry, then we can check in and ask what we might be needing to cope with that feeling. So if we remember that anger is about feeling or needing respect and power and freedom, especially to persist in a goal that's important to us, we can problem solve ways of achieving that. So we might actually express to other people, what is it that we're expecting or what are we trying to pursue and can they actually help us with that goal? When it comes to personal boundaries, um, for those of you who might be sharing close quarters with loved ones and not having a lot of time and space for oneself, it might be about um, asking to have some space um, to check in with yourself and decompress. Uh, we might speak up and advocate for ourselves, right? And we might say no, feeling like there might be too many pressures happening around. We can also leave the situation and try to channel that aggression elsewhere, or we might need to just vent, right, and get that energy out. Okay, so these are some tips on how to assert yourself if communicating your needs or saying no might be hard, which I think it is for a lot of us. Um, and especially these days when see, people seem to have different um, you know, comfort levels about, for example, visiting. Um, right now we are in um, lockdown and there are rules around that, but sometimes things come up in our personal relationships and we um, don't always feel confident or prepared how to communicate what we might be needing. And that can be tricky. That's something that seems to come up in conversations a lot these days. So there's kind of three levels of how to assert what we might need, starting with just basic assertion. So that's just clearly stating your needs, your opinions, your feelings. For example, someone might invite you to come over or meet in some capacity that you're not quite sure if you feel comfortable with at the moment. And it's okay to just say, I'd like some time to think about that, right? Not feeling pressured um, to go along with something for someone else's benefit that might leave you feeling frustrated or, or angry. The next uh, way of doing that is what we call an empathic assertion. So that's actually acknowledging the other person's experience and then adding our own statement. Um, so saying, I know you'd really like to get together, uh, but I don't feel comfortable with that right now. And then the last is kind of a, a last resort, um, but it might be when somebody's continuing to persist in asking you something that you're not feeling comfortable with. Um, and we need to kind of go a level beyond. And this isn't meant to be kind of a threat or punishment, but it is stating the consequence of what may occur if that person um, continues to behave in that way. So an example is that, you know, if you continue to go out and socialize, let's say there's someone in your home who's, you know, has different opinions or interpretations of, of the rules or how you're understanding them, you might just state that that's going to cause me to feel uneasy and I might have to keep some distance. Right? So that's one way that we can assert ourselves and, and state our needs in a way that's different than just yelling, snapping, or completely um, shutting off from that person. Okay, moving along. So the second feeling, this should say number two here, um, that's my mistake. So the second feeling that might be quite common these days is that of fear or anxiety. Um, and fear is a natural, healthy response to threat and danger or the unknown. And it doesn't matter whether this threat is as real as encountering a bear out in the woods or imagining a threatening um, situation to come, such as that of contracting uh, COVID-19, for example, or giving that to someone that we, um, that we care about. And in fact, we should be feeling some degree of anxiety these days because again, it's our body's way of saying there's some danger and it's driving us to keep ourselves and others safe. Now, seeking safety is something that we need when we feel fearful. Um, safety, reassurance, we might feel the need to get prepared for what's ahead. Um, think back to all the stocking up of toilet paper when all this started, right? There's a sense of kind of preparing for the unknown. Um, and so, seeking safety or a sense of preparation can mean literally finding physical space, right? Um, being separate from, from risks, um, but it can also look like a number of different things. Um, and we'll just look at that here on the next slide. So um, often when we're feeling afraid, we might 
uh, be kind of in this worst case or what we call catastrophic like thinking, right? Really like a downward spiral of just where we imagine um, things going in the future. We might be avoiding things that are uh, perceived as dangerous or on the flip side, we might um, be especially focused on those things. Uh, we might, that might also look like consuming media or reading the news um, at really frequent levels that may or may not be so helpful. And we can also engage in unproductive worry, meaning worrying about things that are actually outside of our immediate control. Okay, so some other ways to respond, again, if we recognize that that's signaling to us, so oh, maybe I'm feeling a bit fearful or anxious these days, we have some other options. So first, we can actually assess the, the risk um, more accurately and ask ourselves, what is the worst that could happen and how likely or probable is this to occur? Um, also asking ourselves how immediate or in my control is this? Is there actually a function of worrying about it or is this doing me no good at this point? And in the worst case scenario, how might I cope with that, right? Often when we're anxious, we kind of stop at that worst case, but we don't problem solve how we might actually be okay in that circumstance. So let's say someone in our family did have symptoms or was positive for COVID. Um, how would we actually cope with that scenario? And kind of thinking that through to the end. Um, the other thing we can do is tackling the part that is in our control. Um, so let's say that you're feeling anxious about, for example, um, maybe you're on short-term disability and that's coming to an end. This is something that seems to come up a lot in my work these days with people and they're worrying about returning to work given the current circumstances and the risk of going back. Um, and so this could seriously compromise your health or maybe you have an upcoming treatment that that would really interfere with if you were symptomatic. You may not be able to go into the hospital for your treatments. Um, and so this fear may lead you to take some productive action geared at creating a sense of safety. Um, so maybe you decide to actually take that worry to your doctor and ask about an extended leave of absence. Maybe you decide to go to work, but come up with a plan with your employer so that you can feel a little more safe going forward. So this can be actually the benefit of anxiety when we can turn that into a productive action. This is just a piece of information um, around for those of you who might be having questions about am I at greater risk of COVID right now? That might be a really genuine, legitimate worry that you have. Um, and according to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, um, just recently, last month, um, they're, they're kind of advising that if you currently have cancer and are in treatment, that yes, there might be things that you want to talk about um, with your doctor about that risk. Um, and, but if you do have a history of cancer and are beyond treatment, then there's really not enough research right now to, to um, answer that question. So some of the guidelines are to um, talk specifically with your team about your individual risk level, um, to not make changes to your routine without having those discussions first, making sure that you have your medications on supply um, and not delaying treatments or emergency care. Right, and then consulting with here in Alberta, at least, um, HealthLink at 811. So again, these are some of those practical things that you might do with your worry that might actually settle it when you get a bit more information. Okay. Um, so here, in terms of using a lot of media these days, um, it can be a wonderful tool, especially in this capacity, right? We're meeting here over Zoom today because of technology and the way that it helps us stay connected. Um, but in some ways, uh, it does have the potential to turn into an anxious habit of unhelpful checking or even reassurance seeking, where we might get some temporary relief or a sense of relief from being um, plugged in all the time, but it might be also feeding anxiety. And so it can be helpful to actually set limits to how much media we're consuming right now. You might want to carve out, um, maybe it's just an hour a day. Maybe it's you decide that you're just going to do one check-in in the morning and one at the end of the day. Um, but really trying to limit that and recognizing if it is driving that fear for you. Is it helpful or harmful at this point? And then finally, if you've done everything in your control and you're still feeling a little bit of anxiety, 
this is normal, right? As we talked about, we need a certain amount of anxiety to keep us on our toes and keep us safe. And if we had no anxiety at all, uh, we wouldn't feel motivated to wear our masks, to keep our distance, all those things that keep us safe. But there are some things that can help us um, at that point settle into our bodies, finding good distractions um, that are really engaging. We might um, review or practice, or maybe for the first time, try some new relaxation strategies. Um, and then also you might want to talk to your doctor about medication if it's something that you feel is kind of out of your control and, and more persistent. Okay. This slide is just a really simple way of coping with anxiety in the moment, right? The breath is always there and we all, myself included, we sometimes forget to breathe and yet it can be just a very calming um, practice for any time that we might be feeling fearful. And so um, four kind of simple, straightforward steps. I like to put my hand on my stomach. You might want to even try this right now in our talk um, and really imagine your stomach um, being like a balloon, right? And so when we breathe in, your hand should actually move out as though that balloon is inflating. And when you breathe out, your hand should actually go in as though a balloon is deflating. And the idea is to just practice this for as long as feels helpful. It often takes a bit of time to feel that our breath can start to slow. Um, but you'll notice when you're feeling really anxious or stressed, we tend to hold our breath up in our chest. Um, whereas um, a full breath, like if you've ever seen a baby kind of breathing, right, their belly goes up and down. Um, and that's what we're aiming for. But it can take a lot of practice if we're not used to using our our diaphragm and those muscles in our belly. So I always recommend that people practice this when they're not stressed or anxious, but maybe even in a place of calm to start and then being able to uh, use the breath more in moments when we need it. Okay, moving forward. The next feeling that is common these days for a lot of people is a combination of whether it's feeling sad, down, it might be feeling lonely, um, grief is another thing that's come up for a lot of people. And this is all about when we've lost something or someone that's important to us. That's what sadness signals to us. Um, and so there's been a lot of losses, right, that have come up through the pandemic, whether that's um, actually people that we love that we've lost or even just experiences or plans for the future. Um, this is a really common and understandable feeling right now. Uh, when we're feeling sad, what it's telling us that we need is comfort or to find purpose or connection, kind of a rebuilding of what we feel there's a lack of in that moment. So some of the ways that signal to us that we might be feeling sad or down is withdrawing from people or plans. Um, we might be under or oversleeping or eating. Those can be forms of comfort or soothing for people. We might be feeling kind of low energy, fatigued, a heaviness in the body. Um, we might not be as active uh, as, as usual or as we might like. And we might be thinking a lot about the past rather than being present focused or future oriented. Some things that can help with sadness and be more helpful in the long term if we recognize we're feeling that way is actually to reach out and connect with our supports and whether that's to actually talk about our sadness or um, what we're feeling or not it might just be to reach out and find something you have in common that day to connect over but just really focusing on reducing any feelings of loneliness we might be seeking physical comfort and while sleeping and eating can be those things we might consider other sources of comfort that engage all of our senses right is there a smell that's really calming for you um, physical touch, wearing something cozy or soft, um, having a nice cup of tea, things like that. Um, we also, I think it's really important to allow ourselves to feel sad right now. And depending on the losses we've experienced, we might want to actually honor what was important to us. Um, loss and sadness, that's a signal to, some, to us that something was really important. And so we might just need some time to, to get through those things. We might also want to start um, getting back into some physical activity and we might need to be pretty gentle if it's been a while since doing that or if there have been changes in your health and abilities. 
Um, and lastly, really important to find hope, whatever that looks like for you, ways of connecting with things that, that are important or are missing. So when it comes to helping ourselves through feelings of sadness or low motivation, it's really about finding a balance between accepting and allowing those feelings um, and also looking to change them. So um, here you'll see I've listed something called self-compassion. This is um, just the practice of being kind to ourselves, right? Relating to ourselves in the way that we might to a friend if they were going through something difficult. Um, we all can be our own worst enemies at times and we might not have a lot of patience um, for when we're not accomplishing things that we want, but it's really important to be tender with ourselves. We might even say out loud or there's actually some really nice resources online for guided audio um, meditation for self-compassion where it's about learning how to send ourselves messages like this is hard right now, right? You're, you're trying really hard and this is a hard time. So not actually needing to change what is, but just having a, a gentle relationship with ourselves in those moments. Um, on the other side though, when it, if we do feel like it's time to move out of that feeling and we're feeling ready, um, really important to get outside right now and get as much fresh air as is possible. Um, even if you can't get out and physically move or get out for a walk, um, you know, I really suggest even just if you have a balcony or a front step or even if it's just sitting beside your window and rolling the window open, but just getting some fresh air right now is really important. Maybe even getting out for a drive and rolling the window down. Um, this other next bullet here is about making a list of activities um, and really trying to think about a list of a variety of things that either bring us pleasure or joy in some way uh, or that bring us a sense of accomplishment because we've been productive. And this can be, um, you know, washing a couple dishes, even if that's all we can do in a day, just setting small goals for ourselves or tapping back into things that we enjoyed, but maybe we haven't connected with in a while. And then lastly, uh, before the talk started today, somebody mentioned how important exercise is. Um, and that is absolutely true. We know that from research, exercise reduces um, the activity of our sympathetic nervous system. That's the system that gets triggered when we're in a fight or flight or a stress response. And so physiologically, exercise helps calm our body down. Um, and we know that about 20 minutes uh, a day, three times a week is really where we seem to get those benefits of exercise, including things like just walking. Um, and I encourage you to pick an activity that you enjoy, right? If this is about sustaining our mental health in the long run, there's no point doing something that doesn't appeal to you or you leave feeling discouraged, really setting yourself up to have a, a pleasant experience that you're likely to want to come back to again. And this last point here is just a reminder that motivation follows action, that sometimes we don't have to wait until we feel motivated to start moving. Uh, we know that once we just do it, if we can push ourselves, that motivation tends to build over time. Um, okay, now related to sadness is the feeling of loneliness, right? And this is, um, I think, a pretty uh, understandable feeling these days. I'm not sure that people are talking about this enough. It's really not normal. How um, how distant we all are from each other. And while there are ways like this call and seeing each other over video, it's just not the same, right? And so we're social creatures and um, it's important to tend to those feelings of loneliness as well. Um, now, some ideas would be to um, reach out, you know, by phone, text, over video with loved ones. Hopefully some of you are already doing that. Um, if you struggle to make those calls yourself, you might want to let a loved one know um, that you'd appreciate them checking in with you, right? Asking for that source of connection. Um, and I suggest when you connect with people too, to be really honest about what's coming up for you. You know, it's so common for us to say, how are you doing? And we just kind of respond automatically, doing okay. Um, but I'm finding that the more that we can be honest, you know, maybe, with, maybe we're having a hard day. And it's okay to say that with the right person, of course, if you feel comfortable. Um, it might open up a dialogue and allow that person in turn to express how they're really feeling. And you might feel connected in that experience together. Um, okay. 
And I hear I included here um, some tips. So there's a, a handout around how we might talk to and support people in our lives that we might be worried about or feel like are struggling right now during the pandemic. And that's something I, I can share after the talk today if anybody's interested. Um, just kind of helping people with some prompts of you know how you might approach um, checking in with somebody if you're not really sure how how to have those conversations. So for example, um, you might say, just, just kind of be with them and listen, but you might kind of offer, I wonder how you're feeling. This is really hard. Are there things that you found helped in the past, right? Um, as opposed to giving advice or, or suggesting what people might do, starting with just checking in and listening with the people that you're um, wanting to provide support for. And then final, finally, even in the most limited opportunities to connect with people right now, um, I find even just smiling at a stranger, whether that's in the grocery store uh, or if you're not going to the grocery store, maybe you're out for a walk and you pass somebody on the street, just kind of making eye contact with people and smiling or waving um, goes a long way these days, I think. All right, last but not least, um, joy, right? That's another really important basic feeling that we all need to feel. and. Um, Joy is about telling us that we need to seek out something new. We might need to play in some way, have some fun, or just do what's important to us, right? Connecting with our values. Some ways that we might respond to joy if we're not so aware that we're having that experience might actually be to downplay or gloss over uh, positive things that are going on for us. Some of us might feel a bit shy about that. We might not reach out and connect with people when something is going well. Uh, we might keep that to ourselves. I've also heard people say that they sometimes don't want to let themselves feel happy out of concern that, you know, what if that feeling doesn't last? It might feel harder to allow ourselves to feel some joy and then it pass. Um, and so the, the reality is that a lot of us right now um, typically experience joy. The ways that we experience joy typically are kind of restricted right now. Um, because either the pandemic or maybe because of illness um, and with the current lack of experience that bring joy and positive feelings like travel, visits with, with loved ones, maybe dining out, things like that, um, it's understandable that we might be feeling a decrease in positive feelings, right? There might be a lack of that. And so it takes more effort to create feelings of happiness, but there are some ways that we might try doing that. Some ideas are to actually mark and celebrate um, positive moments or things that are going well for us, right? Maybe it's a, an anniversary of some sort or a birthday um, to commemorate that in some way. That can be really important in expanding that feeling and allowing it to grow rather than shutting it down. Uh, reaching out and sharing those feelings with other people. I think we all, you know, want to hear about the good stuff going on right now. There's enough negative um, discouraging things in the world. I think people are really benefiting from, from good news um, that you might share. Allowing yourself to just feel what's coming up in that moment, to feel happy. And lastly, to express thanks if there's something that we're feeling grateful for, or even just noting to ourselves the, the positive things in our life. Um, so, one of the ways that we can actually create feelings of happiness if they're not naturally coming up in our environment um, is to find things that we know used to bring us joy or it might mean being creative, right? So that word create is really intentional. We might have to think a little bit outside of the box um, and find things that we wouldn't typically do, but that we might have an interest in pursuing at this point in time. These are just some ideas um, that are available you know, on the internet when I did a quick search here of things that we can do pretty safely and, and indoors. Um, but, you know, thinking of your own things, things that maybe you've been putting off that you've had an interest getting into. Um, okay, so this slide here, the second way that we can generate feelings of joy is to actually just look for the things that we already have to feel good about or grateful for. Um, 
One of my patients recently shared with me how helpful it's been for her to practice gratitude every day. Even on the hardest of days, she said that she can always find one thing, even if that only thing that day is her pillow that gives her comfort on a day that she's not feeling well, right? Um, so one way we can try to combine or make gratitude a habit is combining it with something we're already doing. So something that we're, we should all be doing a lot of these days is washing our hands. Um, and, you know, the guidelines are to count to 20 while washing our hands. And so I invite you next time you find yourself soaping up and lathering, um, instead of counting to 20, maybe counting five things in that moment that you can find to feel grateful for. Um, this might actually take longer than 20 seconds, and I really encourage you to not just think generally about, um, for example, grateful um, for family in general, but try to make it specific. I'm grateful that, you know, my, my cousin, my brother reached out to me and had that phone call, right, specifically having that, that support from them. Um, I also recently started doing this in my life. And one thing that's really been nice is actually sharing a list of things you're grateful for with somebody and having them exchange uh, their list as well. Cause that can also highlight some things that maybe you hadn't thought about. Does anybody feel comfortable sharing even just something that's coming up for them that they're feeling grateful for today? I would love to hear, and maybe I can start um, on my, my end. I'm feeling really, grateful to just to be here tonight with you all, right? There's so few opportunities to meet new people in the current um, situation and to see some new faces um, is a real treat for me on a Tuesday evening. So thank you all for, for being here and inviting me. Does anybody else feel like sharing something that they're feeling grateful for? I will. Yeah. I'm just grateful that uh, I can be at home with my family on a daily basis. Mm. Yeah. And is there, what in particular about being home right now is so meaningful? Well, uh, my daughters are in uh, university. They're, they're at home. Uh, I could talk with them over dinner time uh, with my wife and all of us there. I mean, it's a little community. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. So some nice awesome. quality time. Yes. Love yes. that. Excellent. Anybody else feel like sharing? Hi, Dana. It's Brad. Uh, just a, a couple of things said. Uh, there's uh, a couple of us that uh, took a yoga course and uh, every Monday morning, uh, we would do an hour's worth of yoga and our yoga instructor finished the class every day. We couldn't leave until uh, we had thought of five things that we were grateful for uh, in our lives. And uh, it just helped us to focus. Now, one of the things I'm grateful for is uh, for sure our grandsons come to live with us and, uh, He's uh, kept us active and kept, uh, kept us focused on some positive things. And there's less that comes at us every day that uh, we don't feel comfortable handling because he's been around just to show us that optimism uh, for the, uh, the younger generation has despite all the challenges we have. Oh, that's awesome. Thank you for sharing that, Brad. Yeah. And I, I'm curious too, um, I would imagine having to do that five things before you left that yoga class. Did you find that that had an effect on your mood in addition to yoga, which can also be a really great mood booster? Well, it, it made you focus on really even before COVID, this was you know, three years ago uh, when we started this or five years ago now, and it really just started your week off focusing on the good things that are going on. Even if it was a snowy drive into the yoga class, it uh, just really set the tone for the week. It was a great way to start the week, a good stretch and uh, a good mind stretch to 
Yeah, that's a great way of putting it, a mind stretch. And it can feel like a stretch on particularly hard days, right? It can really be hard work to redirect our brain toward the good stuff. So I appreciate this is, you know, maybe easier said than done sometimes, but can be a really great um, exercise, especially if you've never tried it before. All right, so next slide. Um, just kind of winding down here, I asked you earlier in the talk to maybe consider um, something that might stand out to you that you might want to put into practice. Um, and just encouraging you to maybe even just pick one thing that you might like to try or that you think you could benefit from maybe in the next week or even going forward. It might also be helpful to check in and ask what feeling have you been feeling most often lately? Is it anger or irritability? Um, have you been feeling anxious, perhaps a bit isolated? Or maybe you've been feeling pretty content and, and joyful, and that might be something to really celebrate and acknowledge. Okay. And um, lastly, these are just some resources um, that I wanted to share with you all because there are some really great free resources right now around um, maintaining mental health. I think one, I can call it a silver lining, one positive thing perhaps that's come through this pandemic is I think there's greater awareness of how important it is to take care of our mental and emotional well-being. And um, some great organizations have put together some packages and workbooks. So these are some that I've put together here. And um, I think Brad and Dorothy can share that after in a handout. So you don't have to write all this down right now. Um, and included in there, I've included um, our Department of Psychosocial Oncology here at the Tom Baker Cancer Center. We offer uh, counseling services, not only for patients, but their loved ones as well. Um, so that's where you might meet with someone like myself. And then we also have here listed the Mental Health Helpline, and that's a 24-hour phone distress number if you ever just needed to talk to somebody and um, that might feel like the safest place to do so. And then just one last slide here on prostate cancer specific resources. Um, these are just someone, it sounds like these are all familiar to um, perhaps a few of you or maybe all of you. Um, I'm just going to plug here a couple of the things at the bottom, um, particularly our programming at the Tom Baker. Uh, we have classes around things like how to cope through androgen deprivation therapy, as well as services through our OASIS program, um, talking about sexuality and changes that might come up or intimacy more generally. Um, so yeah, those are some additional resources if you'd like to look into those beyond the talk today. Um, but that's all that I've, I've got for you. And thank you so much for your attention. And um, I'm not sure how much time we have, Brad, but if people have questions or we might want to have a bit of a discussion, I don't know if we have time for that. Um, how are we for time? Good. Yeah, sorry, I was okay. on uh, I was on mute and forgot to unmute. Yeah, we have time. Uh, thank you so much, Dana. That was uh, fantastic. I was take, busy taking notes here <laughs> and... Uh, uh, I'll uh, I'll be reviewing those, and uh, I know Dorothy uh, will have those links available. I think on our web page, uh, but if you can't find them, then uh, for sure uh, reach out to us, and uh, Dorothy's got copies of that, and we can just email that out specifically if you can't find it. But we'll try and get it up on our web page. Uh, for sure. And on Facebook. And on Facebook. Perfect. Yeah. So thank you so much uh, for that presentation. Uh, I always learn something new every night when we. Thanks for the get, thumbs get up there. there. <laughs> yeah. I see. And, well, Bill and what's your partner's name there? Uh, Bill Petty. Uh, yeah. yeah. So. Uh, uh, Rose Lynn. Perfect. We, Thanks for we that have, feedback. <laughs> we have time. Uh, we've we're scheduled to uh, to go till uh, nine o'clock. So uh, hopefully, if there's any questions, I want to thank uh, 
all our friends from uh, Toronto who uh, joined us and surrounding area, whether it's Peterborough or Hamilton or Burlington or wherever, uh, the East, we'll just say our uh, friends from the East who joined us tonight, thank you for making time. I know it's late there um, and it would be past my bedtime. Uh, so uh, thank you, but uh, feel free to uh, go ahead, unmute yourself. Dana, you're going to hang around for a little bit to answer some questions. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Or well, even if not questions, if people just want to share any thoughts or reactions or even just how you're all doing these days. Like this is hard times, right? One of the questions I had is, you, you, one of your recommendations was to uh, smile at people on the street, but if we're all wearing masks. <laughs> yeah. It can yeah. be a little difficult, but somebody said to me, you know, I could tell they were smiling through their eyes. Mm. Even though their face was covered, we knew. Well, it's that interesting, Brad, the one thing I have found, the one thing I have found with, with that is that I am a compulsive smiler, but I recognize right away that with the mask, they aren't necessarily going to see it. But it's interesting the number of people that are resorting to hand motions that wouldn't normally. So they come up with different, you know, you, they can do the queen wave or they can do the thumbs up or they can do the salute or it, it's just interesting to me the different hand variations that are coming up now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point though, that uh, can't necessarily express ourselves in the same way. And I think just in general, a theme these days is just being creative, right? About how to still do those things that are important, but are more challenging right now. We have uh, one of our exercise colleagues is hard of hearing and reads lips. So he's, he struggles a fair bit with all the masks and particularly mm -hmm. in the grocery stores and uh, trying to get service when he can't read lips and he can't hear. So uh, mm -hmm. there, there are some real challenges for people. Absolutely. Something I found, I walk around the, the block quite often. I walk a couple of kilometers every, every day. And when the crowds get thick in the parks, I'll walk around the block and sure people. But it is amazing. I've done this for five or 10 years. Eh? In the last year, more people have waved at me, give me a little salute, thank you when you move over things like that, Happy New Year, Merry Christmas, and you're going, okay, this is, this is nicer than I, when I used to walk around the block years ago. So people being grateful, I guess, in a nice way. Yeah. Yeah, I'm noticing that too. It just, it's like somebody reaching out and just kind of, uh, yeah, it goes a long way, that humanity, right? I think there's just so, so, not, that there aren't still ways to connect, but just so different, like unprecedented challenges. And so it's nice though, it's encouraging that, um, you know, that's our human spirit is to actually, we're quite resilient and that when we're all kind of going through this, that there's that natural instinct to just kind of reach out more. It sounds like for you, Wilfred, that that really kind of lifts your spirits, is it? Yeah, well, the other thing we were laughing about the other day, just a reversal of society. Eh? Uh, a neighbor went by and I was going to stick my head on and say, come on in for a coffee or a drink. And then I go, oh, wait a second. We can't do that anymore. And I said, you know, years ago, you I was, come on in. You're welcome. All this routine. Now you say, no, stay away, stay away. Mm -hmm. Reverse, say, eh? yeah. um, human feelings and mind and everything. So it, it's taking, still taking a while to get used to it. That's a really, yeah, really interesting point. I remember when all of this started, the first wave, I had this interesting kind of reflection, and maybe some of you have had it too, just how much we um, are simultaneously reliant on each other to cope and also afraid of each other right now. Like it's this mixed um, tension, right? We want to be near each other and seek each other out. And at the same time, we're actually... Um, we're threats to each other. It's a very strange dynamic. Yeah. And I've caught myself so many times 
the neighbor needed help. I said, jump in my car, I'll take you down to the garage. I said, wait a second, I can't do that. <laughs> or, you know, I'll take you over to the hospital. No, I can't do that. So it, it's, you got to remind yourself all the time. I mean, it's, it's in reverse now. Eh? Yeah. It's carried on and uh, yeah. it's just a habit. You, you have to break that habit. You've done it all your life. You just did it all your life. Now you, you just got to strike it off. Eh? It's a big adjustment. Absolutely. Anybody else have questions or comments that they feel like sharing? I really like that whole business of you uh, talking about rather than counting to 20 when you're washing your hands to actually think about what we're grateful for. I think that's really powerful. I mean, it speaks to mindfulness and all. And um, the strange thing is, and I was just talking to my sister today about this, and that is that, uh, you know, the things that we can be thankful for are can be even also the most mundane. Uh, or common things that uh, we'd actually don't give a thought to on a daily basis, but even if we were to lose it, especially, you know, if you do go to all these different treatments, that you can lose all those things. So it doesn't have to be really spectacular. It could actually be something very simple. You know, being able to breathe clearly through your nose, not having to worry about a dry mouth, you know, being able to just simply walk without any pain or anything like that. All those kind of things that, uh, you know, are mundane, but if you lose, become extremely special. Yeah. That's a so really that's, I, really, I really like, I, I really like your suggestion. Good. Thank you for that feedback. And I think it's a good point too. Um, I like that layer of thinking if we were to lose, like what would we really miss, right? Not taking that for granted. Because even I'm thinking how, what a, what a different world it felt like just before this last um, lockdown here in, in Alberta, right? There were things back in the summer that feel like a lifetime ago, just, um, you know, even being able to go sit on a patio, right? Things like that, or before restaurants closed again, not everyone was feeling comfortable doing those things, but just, um, yeah, even just in the last few months, other things that we've lost. And so, yeah, thinking about what are those things we might take for granted, right? Yeah, the, I throw the word around appreciation, eh? Where you're at and, and, and your health and things like that. Uh, just a short story. My grandmother died in the Spanish flu in 1918. Oh. Really knew this till I was about 10 or 20 and I didn't even know what the Spanish flu was, eh? Uh, just an hour ago, I was watching a show from PBS on polio and how it was uh, uh, the vaccine was inverted the people that took it and I was trying to figure out what year I took it I think it was six or five you know I made it through that eh? and uh, you know you come back 50 years later and you say okay there's something to relate to you got to appreciate the fact that this has happened before and it can happen again and but we're going to handle it you know so it's uh it's, it's just all part of our histories eh yeah so that that's a thank you for sharing that too i think that's that can be very comforting to recall other hardships that we faced um in our history as a you know as a civilization just that we've gone through hard things and we are pretty resilient as human beings right and that technology is always advancing and i think that's another really important thing right now is hope right just trying to be able to think forward about um, when and how things are going to be different again, right? When we adapt, we're going to have to readapt um, to when things hopefully change for the better again. I'm curious, um, I, I can keep taking questions about the talk, but I'm also curious if um, any of you have things that I didn't talk about that you're finding helpful in maintaining your, your mental well-being these days that might be helpful for others to hear about. Just throw the word impeachment out. <laughs> <laughs> I see people laughing even if they're muted right now. <laughs> Leave that one alone. <laughs> but, well, I found a, a software program called Jamulus and I like to play guitar and sing with other people. And uh, 
So I'm able to hook that up and I'm playing and singing with people, a couple of guys from Ontario and a lady from Minnesota and a few guys from around this area. So that's really helped me a lot. So you can kind of hook up your instrument into the computer? Is yep, that? I can, and I've got a wow. mind in <laughs> the whole nine yards. Yeah, it actually works really well. There's very little delay. That's awesome. So that's kind of your, your creative outlet and something that brings you joy, I guess, Bill. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, that's great. That reminds me too. There's so many um, interesting games and things that we can do over video these days too. People have shared with me. Um, you can even do like escape rooms right now. Somebody will take a camera in and walk through the escape room and you can do that as a group. Um, there's things like a game called Scattergories that's free right now that you can share your screen on Zoom. There's all sorts of, and then something called Jackbox. I don't know if any of you have family members that you've maybe played that with. There's just different games that you can pretty nicely play like on a screen like this. So. Yeah, there's some really creative people out there and technology helps a lot with that playful side of things right now. Yeah, we have weekly game night with uh, with uh, our kids and grandkids and uh, relatives. We're playing with people in Manitoba, in uh, BC, and we're all connected and... Uh, we uh, just sit down and you have a little bit of a visit on Zoom or uh, Google Meet and uh, you play games like you would right across the table. <laughs> and uh, my wife is even, uh, she's got into a Scrabble duo with uh, her sister in Halifax and another one in Manitoba. <laughs> so they're, they're playing online Scrabble. Uh, all day long this game goes on and they're back and forth so yeah the technology is just amazing what it's been able to do for us yeah any other thoughts or questions I see your office hasn't changed much since I left, Dana. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I came into my office. I fortunately live close by, but I, yeah, I thought this would be, I didn't want my laptop to go on the fritz or something at home. <laughs> yeah, it's nice to see you again, Dorothy. Wow, such a quiet group, usually. It's... <laughs> hard to get a word in edgewise. So, I see so, some of our talkers didn't make it in tonight, so. I guess this is one way that you're all staying connected and reducing those feelings of isolation. This is a, it's a once a month that you guys have this meeting or? We do a virtual pizza lunch on uh, the first Tuesday of the month and then on the second Tuesday of the month we do uh, we meet in general with uh, a larger group and a more formal presentation so nice the pizza lunches when we were meeting face to face we would share books and we do a book exchange and mm. uh, so it's a little more difficult and what I find is uh, with the virtual meetings, uh, there's less conversation. It's because it's only one person at a time that is able to talk. So mm -hmm. it's uh, a little more restrictive that way, but we stay connected and it's, uh, it's a way to keep up to date. So yeah, it's good. Everybody's so polite, not wanting to interrupt each other, right? The, the I think microphones kind of cut everybody out when you talk more than one at a time on on here. Actually, can I make may I uh, say something yeah. again? Um, so uh, actually, the, um, the thing that you're talking about, Brad, uh, when you have such a large group uh, as you do right now, and you said there's I don't know how many people, twenty or thirty people. Um, so uh, in Toronto, we have our warrior groups meeting. 
um, it's a similar situation. So we have, you know, usually more than 10 or something like that that Winston uh, hosts. Uh, one of the things that we did over the holidays, because we couldn't uh, get together with the family, we had a family Zoom um, secret Santa. And so everybody got to show their gifts uh, sequentially, so it worked out really well. But then when it came time to actually talk with the individual people, we had breakout rooms. Uh, have, you ever th have you guys ever thought about doing that uh, with, your, with your group? in terms of having these breakout rooms. So you can actually have these kind of discussions where you have only about three or four faces in a box. Because once, once you get to, you know, 20 faces in a box, um, it's kind of hard to have a, you know, a free rolling conversation in this context. And when, when everybody is there physically, that's a different story. But um, when you have 20 faces in a grid, it's harder. Oh yeah, especially if you're on a phone or an iPad and there's only then four faces or six max, right? Then you got to scroll through page after page. So it doesn't always work. But the short answer to your question is no, but uh, it sounds interesting and might be something that uh, we would uh, look at doing. Uh, our warrior lunch was originally designed as a social event and then uh, we had a more formal meeting on uh, the Tuesday evening before the general meeting so yeah. but with like anything else COVID changes and uh, we uh, we adapt accordingly so but we're obviously we're open to try new things right because uh, uh, we're now doing these meetings virtually, which we would have never even considered uh, mm -hmm. a year ago. So, yeah, well, they're going to be here for quite a while, I think. Oh, yeah. It's probably going to be here for quite a while. I like the idea of these of these breakout rooms because um, the way that uh, it worked in our family is that we had the host and the host would be the one that would, you know, assign people to the, you know, put different groups of people into a breakout room. Um, you know, you always find some sort of common conversation or conversation starter and it can build from there but it might be just an interesting way of of uh, i mean the group dynamic that you have is 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 really fantastic from what i the little that i've seen but i think it might be an interesting experiment to try out you know if anybody i mean it'd be what, what does any what what do other people in this in this group right now think about breakout rooms so that you're you know um, can have conversations with the different people in the group you know, build connections within the group hi mike it's uh, dave ludd here i um i've got a meeting tomorrow and uh, and uh, there's uh, Oh, there's about 30 of us and uh, there's going to be four uh, four groups and they're going to be in a breakout situation. So uh, this will be the first time to try it. And I don't know, Rhett, if you've got um, any indication as to how uh, how we would do this uh, in terms of the technology. I'm, I imagine it's, uh, it's uh, easily doable. I'm not just familiar with it, that's all. Uh, I haven't tried it myself. I haven't uh, haven't checked it out myself. But uh, I, I think whoever, I, I don't think it'd be difficult to do. Mm -hmm. Breakout rooms you're talking about, is that right? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah, certainly doable, and there's something we can yeah. look at doing for sure. Break off into smaller groups or or whatnot. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Thanks for sharing that. We're always open to new ideas. Hello, uh, this is uh, Peter, Peter Kong. I have a question for Dr. Mill that um, the Foothill Hospital, uh, is all the staff get the COVID uh, shot yet or not yet? Hmm. You're wondering if the vaccine has been offered yes, to people at the Foothill Yes, because how safe we go to the hospital now? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think that 
some of the um, physicians and clinicians are starting to get their vaccines. I've been hearing people who have had the first um, first round of shots so far. In terms of patients um, getting vaccinated, uh, there was a meeting this week, actually, I think it was today that my manager was sharing with us. They're supposed to start talking about when they're going to start offering that to patients. So I think it's right now in the midst of planning how to roll that out. Um, unfortunately, I don't have the details or, or know how to answer that question right now, but I can tell you that just as of Monday, we got word from our manager here um, within supportive counseling for the Tom Baker that um, the higher ups are talking about a plan, not just for providers, but for patients at this point and when that might be happening too. Well, that's a good news, yeah. Yeah, but it, yeah, I guess I can appreciate it's. Um, probably a pretty anxiety provoking place to be right now for a lot of you, whether it's mm. here in, in Calgary or out in Ontario, just being in hospitals right now, you're probably, I imagine, are you feeling pretty vulnerable when you go in? That's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you for Thank that you. question, Peter. Thanks. Yeah, I don't think hospital stays are that long. My sister had brain surgery on New Year's Eve and she was home on uh, the Saturday after. So wow. uh, they, they mm -hmm. didn't want her hanging around too long. Yeah, which I also just makes me think of the loved ones providing support right now for people receiving treatment, right? I think I saw some of you had... Um, partners or supports with you here on the call today. And um, yeah, it just makes me think how much of that responsibility gets shifted to people at home providing that care when the, the stays in hospital are shorter. Well, and access is restricted, right? Uh, I've gone in for bone and CT scans and, you know, my wife's had to wait out in, in the car and, mm. uh, you know, it's very stressful. Uh, yeah, because uh, an hour scan seems to take forever when you're mm -hmm. sitting in the car w waiting for somebody to text you that they're at the front door to get picked up. So yeah, yeah. absolutely. And then there might be people who who don't have somebody even to drive them to the hospital or to care for them at home. And so that's a whole other challenge for people living alone right now. Yep. Mm -hmm. Good. Well, if there's no other questions, we're running short of time. We've got only a few minutes left. Again, Dana, I want to thank you so much uh, for your uh, insight tonight and for sharing and uh, making us think about things in a different way. And uh, I've got some good notes and I'll... Uh, I'll be looking at how I can change how I approach some of the things that cross my plate in a day. So I uh, appreciate that. Thank you to all our members. Uh, it was great to see you again. I appreciate you making time to uh, participate. And uh, thank you, Dorothy, for putting this together. And thank you, Rhett, for keeping us all connected. Uh, we appreciate that. So with no other questions, uh, I'm going to wish you all a good evening. Uh, again, Happy New Year if I missed you at the start. Stay safe, stay healthy, and stay at home for the most part, I guess. Uh, so be good, everybody, and uh, we will see you in uh, February. Yes, thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you.